A Brief History of Theatrical Makeup in the West While actors in Western theater probably used some makeup on stage, just as normal people used makeup in various eras for daily cosmetic purposes, there are no records describing how makeup was applied for the stage before the middle of the 19th century. This is probably because before the invention of gas lighting, most actors didn't need much makeup most of the time, or simply adapted ordinary street makeup to stage use. Still, we know that through theater history, despite the complete lack of a written tradition on the application of stage makeup before the 1850s, performers at various times still used makeup in various ways. In Athens, in the 5th century BCE, it is said that Thespis, in his first tragedies, anointed his face with white lead, then he shaded his face with lees of wine. But very shortly after that, he introduced the use of masks made of shaped linen, eliminating any need for makeup. Images from medieval drama seem to indicate masks and perhaps some makeup usage, but while a few medieval masks have survived, the evidence for makeup is quite unclear. In the Renaissance, there is a brief mention in Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream of 1595, where Bottom the Weaver debates what color of beard he should wear for his role as Pyramus, but we have no indication if this means he intends dyeing his beard or wearing a false one. However, Much Ado About Nothing does give ample evidence that false beards were in use, since it is impossible for an actor to play Benedict without one. All other mentions of makeup in Shakespeare's plays are about the paints women wore in private life, rather than the paints most probably similarly used by actors to play women. In the Restoration Era, Samuel Pepys' diary of October 5, 1667, describes visiting the actresses Nell Gwynne and Mrs. Knepp backstage before a performance. But Lord, to see how they were both painted would make a man mad, and did make me loathe them, and yet what a show they made on the stage by candlelight is very observable. An actor named Mr. Johnson, who played at the Lincoln's Inn Theatre in this same era, was noted in John Downe's memoirs of the stage as being very skillful in the art of painting his face, which Downes believed was a great improvement to the art of acting. Riccoboni, a notable actor of the Commedia Italienne in Paris, observed on a visit to London in 1727, a young actor of 27, who portrayed an old man so convincingly that at first he would not believe he was not old. He was shown the actor dressing himself, taking an hour to disfigure his face with the assistance of pencils and painting his eyebrows, to make an old age makeup convincing at six paces. However, again, details of the cosmetics used or their application are lacking. Till 1789, when actor Francis Godolphin Waldron, a later editor of Down's work, mentions that this refers specifically to painting lines on the face in India ink to imitate wrinkles. Waldron further states that in former times this was carried to such excess that some actors looked as if they were acting through a mask of wire. However, he praises David Garrick's subtlety and ability when aging his face for the role of Lear, and indicates that by the late 18th century the excessive use of black lines had gone out of fashion. We do know that before the mid-19th century, actors would have had access to the popular street makeup products whitening face powder and rouge. We also know that when white actors portrayed characters who were non-white, they used bowl armenia, the pigment base of burnt umber paint, for a reddish-brown tone, or burnt a cork to make a dark brown or black tone. Other improvised items that were probably used include lamp black, the oily black residue left by flames on the inside of lamp glass, which was popularly used by women in lieu of mascara. Burnt matches, once matches were invented in 1827, were used as impromptu eyeliner pencils. India ink was used for black lines, and burnt paper to make gray. The only specialties made for theater seem to have been spirit gum and wool crepe hair, which were used, as they are now, to make temporary beards and were also used initially to make false noses before the use of nose and scar wax. As stage lighting changed from candlelight to brighter gas in the mid-19th century, and commercial theaters began to be built in larger sizes, strong makeup suddenly became increasingly important, and the first stage makeup pamphlets and books are produced, detailing the new makeup techniques and products of their time. The first wave of these techniques comes in the 1850s through 1870s, when actors worked with ground mineral pigments used by painters. Suggested pigments of this time are three kinds of white, Dutch pink, 
rouge, carmine red, and ruddy rouge, Mongolian brown, powdered blue, and chrome yellow, and antimony, a metallic gray-black used for shadows, which was toxic. Then, according to legend, in the 1850s or 1860s, a German actor, variously reported to have been either Karl Baudius or Karl Herbert, was supposed to have invented grease paint, and an Anglo-French actor, Charles Fechter, subsequently spread its use to the U.S. when he toured here in the 1870s. Homemade grease paint was made by blending lard with mixes of the powdered pigments. When German companies began manufacturing grease paint sticks in the 1870s, grease paint was quickly adopted everywhere, just in time to help actors deal with the new harsh electric lighting that came into theaters in the 1880s and 1890s. The 1890s saw incredible innovations in makeup, most of which are still in use today, including nose wax, Emile Noir, which is black tooth enamel, black tooth wax, cold cream and cocoa butter, mascaro in multiple colors, lipsticks, blue eyeliners, ladies' liquid colors for arms and necks, sticks for application of color, wig joining paste, Vaseline, and ready-made ventilated wigs and mustaches. By 1900, even walk-on actors and amateur performers used makeup kits like these, which contain ingredients quite similar to modern kits. However, their application used much stronger color and contrasts than we do now to compensate for the harsh white light from the time before gelled lighting. You can see this in the clip where I replicate female makeup for three ages as shown in the circa 1900 booklet, Makeup Book for Professionals. The Makeup Book for Professionals, which is included on this disc, also shows how socially acceptable it was for white actors to play roles of people of other races in the most popular forms as little more than racist caricatures. However, by the time James Young's hugely popular book, Making Up, was written in 1905, the actors profiled in it could be seen to take considerable pride in doing makeup that portrayed individualized characters of other ethnic groups and not to lump all into a single race caricature as shown in earlier books. Actor Wilton Lakai writes in detail about the process used to design the physical appearance of the noble Rabbi Shemuel in Children of the Ghetto, as contrasted with the evil mesmerist Svengali in Trilby, both Jewish characters but visually similar only in longer hair and noses. Actors in this era prided themselves on virtuoso makeup transformations and pretty well took the art of stage makeup as far as it could go with the available materials. After the 1920s, stage lighting gradually became subtler, which lessened the need for extreme makeup. In contrast, the burgeoning film industry was continuously needing new makeup products to deal with the rapidly changing technologies of film stock and lighting. Max Factor, perhaps the most influential makeup innovator of this era, fled Tsarist Russia with his family and ended up in Hollywood in 1914. After having problems with the look of stage grease paint sticks on film actors in 1922, he invented liquid grease paint in tubes, which went on more thinly than sticks. In 1932, Max Factor also created the first student makeup kits, like these, which came with his series of instructional pamphlets, illustrated by the actor John Carradine. Further changes in film stock in 1937 prompted him to create Pancake, a non-reflective water-based makeup that looked good in color films and was subsequently adopted by many stage actors as well. Since that time, film makeup artists have generally driven all the innovation in makeup both technologically and design-wise, and theatrical makeup occasionally picks up these new products and techniques from film as needed, while still relying mainly on the painterly techniques pioneered in the 1900s which have proven to be best adapted for the stage. To learn more about the early history of stage makeup techniques, this disc includes complete printable PDF facsimiles of a large number of early, extremely rare makeup books for your further study, as well as pamphlets and the makeup section of a once popular book on blackface minstrel shows. This material is interesting not only for learning more on makeup technique, but is enlightening about the role of actors in the debates about race and nationalism in 19th and early 20th century America.